Good morning. So this is what happens when you ask academic people to give you two slides. So I have to be honest, Brian told us each to give him two slides, and I think we came in around 40. So <laughs> it's a hazard of the business. Uh, but let me try and quickly just point out to you, my pitch today is that you are sitting in the middle of a perfect storm, okay? There are forces that have come together at this point in time that are making the kinds of things you're seeing here possible for every one of your students, okay? So I want you to think about that. And in the background of your mind, I think we should all think about who are you? Like, like there are seven billion people on the planet. How is it that you're sitting in the middle of all of this access, and of course the Spider-Man question, what responsibility does that mean that we have to use these resources? So if we let students take control, what are they taking control of? What can we give them to work with? I would say the first thing we have happening here is revolutionary access to software and hardware. So the Raspberry Pi case that uh, Bill just referred to, we're talking about a $35 computer a complete Linux computer that you can buy off Amazon any day you want, $35 total, has HDMI, has <laughs> internet access, unheard of, right? We're talking about having, let's see, there we go. Uh, this is our students getting their uh, cards, getting their boxes filled with sensors and uh, Pi boards, uh, Arduinos, and they're faking enthusiasm for <laughs> the camera. But off camera, they were very enthusiastic. Um, so these little teeny Arduinos can come in the size, they have a form factor the size of a quarter if you want, okay? You can pick them up for $3 down at Micro Center in St. David's. So this is unprecedented, okay? This is not just how things have always been moving along. If we, here we have a bunch of tablets, we have software doing the same kind of unprecedented access. So App Inventor is a product that uh, was made on a sabbatical. Google gave it back to MIT. MIT made it completely free. So you can develop Android apps with a visual drag and drop interface. We've used it with fourth graders. We've used it with 10th graders. MIT is using it with their grad students. It's not watered down. In fact, the software that makes App Inventor is free. And you can download and alter that if you want. So the access that our students have to hardware and software is something like we've never seen before. We have students posting applications into the Google App Store in our minus one programming course. So we have a one, two, three series. We made a minus one for people who just wanted to try it out. And see. They're posting <laughs> programs and apps and games into the App Store at the end of their minus one course. They've never, they were, these are students coming in like knowing that the X closes the window and that's about all. Come back to me, there we go. Okay, but we can take them from there to actually taking their ideas and sharing them. And that's not happened too often, okay? There's a second force fueling all of this. Revolutionary access to modern fabrication technologies. So. That doesn't mean too much to me when I first started thinking about it, but this is what we're saying. There are now computer controlled fabrication techniques, not just 3D printing, okay? 3D printing is very, very cool. There's a whole revolution in subtractive technology, all right? Taking material away and creating something. So this is a plasma cutter, all right? You put a sheet of metal underneath, you take a file from Adobe Illustrator, and this is a little pattern that I did a whole sabbatical down here, so it was hard for them to even pull me away. Um, you know, you, you can take a, make a jigsaw puzzle on Adobe Illustrator, and then you can run it through the laser cutter and have it cut the pieces out of plywood. But you can also run it through the plasma cutter and have it cut the pieces out of eighth inch steel and put the puzzle together, okay? It used to be that, wow, these are fantastic, nice, numerically controlled machines. I'm sure they're in some distant factory somewhere far away. No, you just can go online, go to Pinoco, and your students can take any Adobe Illustrator pattern or file they have, they can laser etch it onto any kind of material, onto leather, onto anodized aluminum, onto glass, and hit a button. And you can say, all right, I'd like to order 50 of them or 6,000. 
or you can go down to any of the maker spaces showing up in the area, like Next Fab on 20th Street in Philadelphia. They have another spot on 4th and Girard. They opened another one in Wilmington because these are blowing up. This is like a gym. You pay maybe $20 a month, say, right? You get access to all kinds of a wood shop, a metal shop, a welding shop, uh, 3D printing, laser etching, and there's somebody standing there to teach you how to use it. So we've had students say, look, you know, I'd really like to do a project. I think I'd weld, if I, in a perfect world, like I would weld together this case, and then I'd have this Arduino control the locks on each of the drawers, and then I'd write the software so that it controlled the barcode swipe and knew when somebody borrowed one of the, these are systems that they sell for $25,000. So my students built one as a final project for $250, because they went down to Next Fab and did the welding themselves, <laughs> right? They have, we have all kinds of books on maker skills. That's an internet-enabled light bulb you see in the picture there. I mean, all of these things are available at an unprecedented level. So we have a course, and I have to say, this is a big faculty gamble. I know this isn't easy, but I took a week, a week I, I'm whispering because I still can't believe I did it. I took a month out of the schedule. I said, we're not gonna teach that month, not in the way of me talking to you. You're gonna come up with a project. I did it all, and no one knew I was doing it. Celeste encouraged me, no one else knew. <laughs> like, it's not, right, it's not an easy thing. You come up with a project, and then we'll see what all these groups need to learn about, and that's what we'll teach that week. And then we'll have a big presentation and we'll show the, where this is the programming two course, we'll show the programming one students what could happen if they just stayed one more semester. All right? So we've been doing this for about five or six years now. I never would have assigned projects this hard. Never. I would. Here's a project you can't see because the picture is from my camera and I didn't do too good a job of it. So this team of three people built this frame they found a place in King of Prussia that sells a two-way-ish, kind of one-and-a-half-way type of mirrored glass. And they made a smart mirror so that you walk up to it. If you see in the bottom corner there, it's displaying the time and the weather. It's displaying their Google calendar, their Google to-dos for the day. They put a wireless button on the front, so you tap that button, and you've already run the mobile app on your phone to set it up for your needs and it knows where you're going to work that day, and it's checked with SEPTA to see if there are any delays on the line for SEP from SEPTA, and put that up. Then you push the button again, it goes to your wireless scale. <sighs> I didn't even know there was a wireless scale. It goes to your wireless scale, checks the history of how your weight's going, and puts up a really encouraging message. <laughs> right? I'll say there was a woman on this team because <laughs> that kind of caretaking only happens when women and software get together, I think. They did this in a month. It was the end of their first year of programming, okay? I never would have assigned it. I never would have expected it. But this convergence of abilities comes from also having this third factor, revolutionary social access. So we started, my generation said, oh, you know, this is not a good thing. The students are gonna talk to each other. They're gonna know the answers on the exams. They're gonna share homework, oh my God. So what it's become is maybe the greatest distribution and democratization of information we've seen. So this is what my students' laptops look like now. This doesn't mean that Uber sticker doesn't mean that they use Uber. It means that they spent a weekend at a hackathon with the developers from Uber, helping them use the API to make Uber better. Okay, these are not hackathons that prevent and only allow the graduate students, or there are high school students at these hackathons. Penn Apps down at University of Pennsylvania runs them twice a year. 2,000 students, there are students flying in from Enische um, Technica Hochschule in Switzerland to be at this. And the high school students who show up from the area, the entire place stops and gives them a standing ovation every year for being there. This is being around the 2,000 people who are gonna take care of 
Here it is. Um, the, not the most recent one, the one before that. Comcast said, why don't you have it at the Wells Fargo Center? So we had students from Monco at the Wells Fargo Center for the weekend, and the pillowcases they gave them said, sleep, eat, code, sleep, eat. <laughs> All right, so they met, everybody from Google comes in, there's our uh, student, Sufi Benor, um, and that's what he looked like on Friday, and this is what he looked like on Sunday. So it's not easy, maybe, but they take breaks and get donuts, they go, I mean, it's a social event as well as an enormous programming event that exposes you to ideas that people have not seen before. This is from the event we have where our pre-programming students come see our programming students' projects. A lot of my students' projects, they're not starting with a blank page. There are sites like GitHub where everybody is sharing their code. If you can make it better, make it better. The code for the drone that Bill talked about is from Brazil, okay? And we had students who took down the code and said, you know what, this is a bad way to do this. Let me make it better and then reposted it, and it's now being distrib distributed internationally. So uh, we have students who say, you know what, I would love to, uh, one of our students said, you know what, I would love to have, there are a lot of Korean places in Lansdale, right? There's a lot of Korean language on the signs in Lansdale. Wouldn't it be really awesome if, depending on which way was easier for you, you could hold up your phone and the Korean would start showing up in English, or you could hold up your phone and the English would show up in Korean. All right, so this is Rob who's right in the front row who's embarrassed right now maybe. <laughs> so, so what do you do? That's a hard project when you've only been programming for a year. Unless you go onto the web and you can get the master's dissertation from somebody at the University of San Francisco who's been thinking about this, start with that code and then make it better. And that's what he did with his team. I have no problem with that, cheating? Like, you cheat all day if that's how you're gonna cheat. If you're gonna figure out master's level code from somebody else and then be able to improve it and distribute it around, you see what we know now is that students get motivated. There's a really clear understanding of human motivation at this point, right? It, Daniel Pink's book Drive talks about this. Do people get motivated by three things? Autonomy. You're not very motivated when somebody else is telling what you what to do every bit of the day. Yeah, you know that. <laughs> you, we have all know that, right? Autonomy, mastery, you've gotta be able to see yourself getting better or you lose interest. There's gotta be some measure of performance that you can watch yourself get better at, okay? And then purpose. If you don't have those three things, if you don't feel that the work you're doing is helping someone, that it matters, if you don't feel in charge of the work you're doing, if you can't see that you're getting better at it, you're gonna be dragging people to the finish line, okay? But if you can find a way to put those three things into the way you conduct work with students, you're standing at the center of a perfect storm of support and resources for you, and your students will do things that amaze you. Thank you very much.